Good evening and welcome to In Conversation. I'm your host, Art Levine, Professor of Ethics and Legal Studies in the College of Business Administration at California State University, Long Beach. Our special guest tonight is Admiral Eric Olson, a four-star admiral, 38-year Navy SEAL, and until his recent retirement, commander of the U.S. Special Operations Command in charge of all special forces. He is legendary in his field and has been aptly described as the most important man you never heard of. We are honored to have Admiral Olson with us today. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Art. It's good to be with you. Admiral Olson is here on the campus of California State University, Long Beach, as our sixth annual distinguished speaker, and we were able to get him to come over and tape uh, this special show, and Admiral, we're honored to have you in our community. Thank you. Uh, tell the folks at home what Special Operations Command is all about. Yeah, the United States Special Operations Command is a command that was established uh, a little over 25 years ago to, uh, to organize, train, equip, and send forward uh, the Special Operations Forces uh, from each of our military services. Army, Navy, Air Force, and now Marine Corps. It totals about 63,000 people, about 20,000 of whom are the operators of the special operations community, and the other two-thirds or so are the full range of disciplines that it takes to, to give them their, uh, their broad set of capabilities. It, uh, it, the, the, the command itself was legislated into being in the aftermath of our failure to rescue the 52 American hostages held in Tehran, Iran. Previously, in each of the special forces were within the branch With, of the within, military. Within each service. Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps each had special operations forces. Uh, but a few years after that failure, it was decided uh, by the Congress that establishing a command that was solely focused on developing the nation's special operations capabilities with a dedicated budget uh, to do that, uh, with acquisition, with research authority, uh, to do that would make uh, that kind of complex operation uh, more likely to be successful should it have to be conducted again. And of course, there have been several operations since then have been at least that level of complexity. And you were the first three-star admiral and four-star admiral to be in command of the U.S. Special Operations Command. I was the first uh, three-star Navy SEAL and then the first to be promoted to four stars and as well the first Navy officer to command the United States Special Operations Command, which can be commanded by any service, but the yes. majority of the forces is from the Army, and so it had, had typically more Army commanders. Well, among the missions of your special operations, of course, was the one, the successful mission <coughs> that took down Osama bin Laden. And I know you can't go into detail about it, but tell us what you can about that successful mission. Yeah. First, first, I want to be clear what my role was that it, in that was so that it's not overstated. Um, I had no operational authority uh, for that mission. I was responsible for providing the force uh, that conducted it. And along the way, I became involved in the training to a degree in the rehearsals and the recommendations. And then at the time of the mission itself, I was the senior military advisor in the, in the command center that was conducting uh, that operation. Um, but, uh, but what I took from that experience uh, really was five points worth, worth making, I think, to a broader audience. Uh, five factors that I think led to success, and it wasn't a perfect raid, none are, but, uh, but, but this was a highly successful raid against a strategically important target. So I'd say first it was uh, sort of building the big team. Who needed to know about this? Who didn't need to know about it? Uh, how did you build a level of confidence across a complex, joint, uh, multi-service, interagency community uh, so that when it came time for the president to make the decision, he had the confidence that the right team had been put together to do that and they had done the right actions from the very beginning uh, to, to develop the, the mission to the point of um, where he would be confident in its success. Two, I'd say build the small team. Uh, the, who is actually going to be on the ground, in the air, on that compound, making those millions of decisions that have to be made almost in isolation because of the speed of the operation. Uh, and so this was a special operations uh, combined force that did this. It, it involved a ground force and an aviation force that had worked together 
on dozens, hundreds of missions uh, over the previous few years and had proven not only their knowledge and competence in each other, but uh, but to those who... And they had trained extensively, extensively. together. And we, I read that a full-scale mock-up of the compound yeah. was built and they yeah. practiced no, and, exactly and right. you were, in fact, there when, for some of that training. No, and I'll, yeah, I'll get to that. I, I, I'd say point three is is be ready. And I would attribute many of the important decisions uh, that led to success on that raid to, to decisions that were not made in the weeks or months prior to it, but in in some cases a dozen or 15 years prior. The the average age of the operator, either on the ground or, or in the cockpit, was mid-30s. The equipment that they flew was a dozen or more years old for the most part. The the weapons that they carried, all of that was uh, was a result of decisions that had made, been made a long time prior. So I can't overemphasize this uh, this necessity to be ready because you you don't know exactly what's going to come. And, and in in my parochial view, I admit that's um, part of the value of creating the United States Special Operations Command 25 years ago. Fourth, directly to your point, is is this plan, train, rehearse, plan, train, rehearse, plan, train, rehearse over and over and over again under the most realistic conditions that you can. Same time of day, sun at the same angle, same kind of weather, same kind of dust conditions, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, over and over again. I liken it, to, uh, and then train for success, um, although nothing will ever go exactly as it was planned. Uh, so you also train for failure so that you will deal, be able to deal with whatever does go wrong. And I liken it to, uh, to a medical MRI which slices a patient into hundreds of slices and lets the doctor look at each slice independently uh, to evaluate what might be wrong with the patient uh, in that slice. And, and if, you, if you think of slicing a mission chronologically into hundreds of slices, and in each slice think what can go wrong at this point, and if it goes wrong, what will we do about that? Uh, is is extraordinarily important, and, and in fact, the helicopter crash it proved itself. Yeah, as uh, as I think everybody now knows, one of the two helicopters carrying troops uh, onto that compound uh, crashed in a in a lot next door to to the lot where the house was. And you would think that that's a devastating accident. Abort uh, the mission. It, abort the mission, but in, in fact, that wasn't the case. They had prepared for precisely that contingency, and it was a, 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 a pretty flat voice over the radio uh, that said roughly, uh, we've got a helicopter down, we're executing the contingency plan. And the fact that there was a plan and everybody was confident in it. Made and you had trained on that plan. They had Absolutely. trained on that plan. Plan rehearsed, yeah. And, uh, and then fifth is, is the value of keeping secrets secret. Uh, those who did know about that raid in advance didn't talk about it. There were no indications. It was a complete surprise. And it was essential that it be a complete surprise. And then in the aftermath, of course, uh, to protect those who were involved, to protect their, uh, their families and their capabilities, um, the less said, the better. Well, um, as you know, uh, a book came out written by a former SEAL, an unauthorized book, and uh, uh, I understand the SEAL community is not happy about that, and the command staff is not happy about that, And uh, but it was widely publicized, and he was on 60 Minutes. Uh, how does something like that happen when you have someone who is trained to be a SEAL that's so much a matter of teamwork, and something, someone leaves the reservation like that? Yeah, to their great credit, the community is full of people who don't highlight their own successes or advertise the nature of their work. Occasionally, uh, one wants to tell uh, his story. And, uh, and in this case, I think that really he put himself in, in triple jeopardy. He, he is facing some sort of action, some sort of criminal or civil action. Of course, a confidentiality agreement was signed with the SEALs. Absolutely. He's facing uh, being ostracized by his teammates uh, who don't appreciate sort of private conversations being replayed in, in, uh, in best-selling books. And he is arguably f putting himself at higher risk. Um, the Al-Qaeda websites were pretty vibrant with, uh, with his name once it became known. And, uh, and, and he, he would be, in the view of some, obviously a, a higher priority a target himself for having identified himself as being on that mission. It doesn't happen often. You still don't know the names of the three SEALs who shot the pirates on the Marisk, Alabama. You don't know who pulled Saddam Hussein out of his hole. You don't know the names of any other uh, person who was on the bin Laden raid, and, and that's the way the community 
prefers to keep it. There's something to a civilian uh, very moving about this concept of teamwork, having each other's back, uh, knowing that if you get into trouble, uh, your teammates will be there for you, and, uh, and doing things privately without bravado and getting the job done. No, it, it, is a, it is part of the culture of the special operations community. Every community has its culture, and, uh, and within the culture of the special operations community is, is precisely that. People have not uh, typically highlighted their own individual contributions, but instead wanted to give the team credit. And the SEALs that make it through training, the Admiral was telling me before we went on air, you were in a class of 54 SEALs, and they're all obviously uh, been pre-screened, but out of those 54, only four made it to become SEALs. Correct. So the attrition rate is very high in the training. Historically, it is high. It's a demanding course. Uh, I'll, I'll tell a little interesting piece of that, not well understood uh, by me until later in my career. Uh, about 80% of those who start don't make it, no matter how fit or motivated they are. About 70% of the ones who don't make it leave of their own accord. They just decide one day to, uh, to leave the program. Uh, and about 70% of those leave either at breakfast or during lunch. It is, it is fear of the next hard thing, something you know is gonna, might be cold, miserable, painful, uh, it's the fear of taking that on that causes most people to, to leave. Uh, very few people quit actually in the middle of an event. Uh, once they start it, they tend to see them see it through. So from that perspective, it's a very successful program and sort of weeding out those who are afraid to take on something because it might be really hard. Well, as we end this segment, let me uh, share a, a SEAL philosophy, which I know you know only too well, which I just recently read. The only easy day was yesterday. <laughs> kind of sums up what you were saying. We'll be back with this wonderful interview after these messages. At the beach, science is a hands-on affair. New science buildings with state-of-the-art laboratories combined with outstanding faculty mentors are engaging students in cutting-edge research and providing an unmatched level of science education. More CSUOB students go on to earn doctoral degrees in science and technology than from any other university of its kind in the nation. To learn more, visit us on the web. Science at the Beach, educating students through research. There's a world of opportunity available through the College of Continuing and Professional Education at Cal State Long Beach. Have you ever thought about a career in managing sports teams or sports facilities? You can get started by taking the graduate program in sport management. Learn what it takes to become part of this exciting field from prominent instructors who are working in the industry. For more information, contact the College of Continuing and Professional Education at Cal State Long Beach. Welcome back to In Conversation with our special guest, Admiral Eric Olson, former commander of the U.S. Special Operations Command. Admiral, your address to the Distinguished Speaker Series audience uh, recently was the world at night. Uh, it's a very provocative image, and it's a, the slide that you showed is very powerful. Tell us about what that means. Yeah, thanks. I, I don't mean for it to be a, a double entendre. It's not about conducting operating, you know, night operations. It's, uh, it's really drawn from a photograph that struck me as I was struggling to, um, to, to understand how our strategic interests had shifted since 9-1-1. And, and when I saw this composite photograph uh, provided by NASA of the Earth uh, taken at night, uh, shows where the lights are and where the lights aren't, it struck me that our Cold War strategic thinking was that the important places on Earth are where the lights are, that people live there, societies are developed there, goods are produced there, people and things move east and west across that relatively narrow band of the, of the mid-northern hemisphere. Think of our friends there, think NATO, think of our adversaries, potential adversaries there, think Soviet Union and Communist China. Uh, but 911 struck us dramatically. Uh, causing us to shift our gaze a bit to the south, uh, to a band in the, below the, the band of bright lights, uh, 
to where societies aren't as developed and borders are more porous and airports are less secure and open areas are less governed uh, where training camps can can develop where societal conditions may contribute to the recruitment of of people to terrorist or terrorist related activities and and if you look back at the at the attempted strikes on the United States since 9-1-1, just the ones we know about, the Times Square bomber and the Detroit underwear bomber and the Portland teenager and the ink toner, those are traceable back to the places where the lights aren't. And, uh, and we found ourselves in many ways unprepared to, to deal with those places because we simply didn't under, have the depth of understanding. We didn't historically have military to military relations with them. We were pretty good at speaking Spanish, French, and Russian, but we weren't good at all at speaking Dari, Pashtu, Urdu, or Igbo. And, uh, and so this, is, this, this world at night is really alluding to shifting our gaze to the south uh, to, where the, to where the lights aren't. And special operations forces have a particular role to play in this new world. They do. Special operations forces are regionally oriented. oriented. They are out um, in terms of being global scouts, if you will, every day, uh, conducting some sort of an activity, not missions, not operations, but some sort of activity, most often a training activity, uh, with counterparts in about 70 countries uh, on any given day. Uh, so they are out there. Uh, but we, we found ourselves, even within the special operations community, underprepared Sure. to really understand the nuances of these places, the effects of these places, the effects of terrain and climate and religion and family histories and tribal relationships and all of that that are more and more important to developing the right military strategies. Uh, when you are engaged in potentially in what uh, a retired British general, Rupert Smith, calls war amongst the people, uh, it's an entirely different set of factors that you have to consider as compared to facing a column of tanks or a fighter jet in air-to-air -air combat. And when we do a drone attack uh, after a, a terrorist target and a hit collateral damage, as it's called, uh, we could be creating new terrorists with the families and friends of those who were accidentally hit. It's, Im it's important to be able to accurately predict the effects of your behavior and then have a plan to deal with the negative aspects of that. One of the problems, of course, is no return address for some of these groups. They do something bad to us, and where do you go? Uh, you know, there's no one place where you can focus. And then secondly, it seems, with the new technology, uh, increasingly lethal bombs and weapons can be in increasingly small packages, and so you have a double whammy. The, uh the, 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 the enemy is less obvious now. Uh, not wearing a uniform, not in formation, not under an identifiable command and control of relationships, often operating as a surrogate or a, almost a franchisee, uh, a subscriber to an ideology. Uh, and so from that standpoint, it's also important to, to gain the operational context of a place. It just struck me, our Revolutionary War, the British marched in with red coats and all of the majesty and all that, and we took them down. From, we, we, from were the, the, we were the insurgents. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I know that uh, you're now uh, uh, teaching as an adjunct professor at Columbia. I am. And it struck me that, that, in a sense, you've been teaching all through your career. You've been training these troops, you've been motivating them, and, and now you're doing, uh, now you're teaching just in a different context. Yeah, I, I, I haven't uh, really thought of myself as a teacher through my military career, although I know there are some aspects of teaching that come into, into being a commander of a, a unit. Um, but what I'm trying to do now really is share some of my experience and, and draw from the, the students. Ideally, I will get much more from it than they do. They, that's what uh, they say. <laughs> uh, and and I'm, I'm uh, really enjoying my, my yeah. academic experience. Uh, let's go back to the, the kinds of missions that you and other SEALs have, have done. The bravery, uh, facing, facing death as you go into a mission and not blinking. Uh, 
there's fear, but you have to learn how to control the fear, I guess. Just just speak to a couple of the missions that you're familiar with and, and how people react to the dangers embodied in these missions. Yeah, I won't, uh, I won't go into any specific missions or, or events. I will tell you that, uh, that there is a high level of courage, a high expectation of courage. And, and I think an overriding emotion is to not let one's teammates down. Uh, most of our highest awards have been granted not for attacking the enemy, but for saving our own. Really? And uh, the acts of raw bravery, of extraordinary courage that, that one sees in a, in a real firefight, of people giving up positions of relative security to rush into a hail of fire to pull a wounded teammate back to safety. It's, uh, it's just amazing to see that. Some of it in the special operations community certainly comes from the tight bonding. I mean, the fact that people know each other well, train with each other for long periods of time, and, and almost become a family. And there's a culture of uh, there's a culture that is created in this family, and, and it has to do with values and teamwork. And uh, just just speak a little bit to the SEAL culture. It's. Uh, it's interesting that a few years ago, some of the SEALs, the, the more junior to mid-level operators, wanted to sequester themselves and craft their own ethos document to send up the chain of command. And uh, as a commander, I got to tell you that it's exactly the kind of document that any boss would hope to, to hear from the, uh, from the ground floor. And it talks about pride, about honor, about humility, about never quitting, about persevering through, uh, through any, uh, past any obstacle, uh, and about ultimately about mission success. Um, so that, that is part of the culture. And as I said, this was not a shiny document passed down to the troops. This was what they crafted themselves, and it's very powerful. It just struck me that you know a lot of organizations have codes of conduct and codes of honor and all that stuff. But you guys really walk the walk. I mean, you live this and you practice it. And even though you, you deal with tragedy and deaths and losses, in a sense, it must be quite uplifting to see a group of people that embody a culture of values that are so strong and so positive and so right. Just an amazing community and, and so pleased that, that my career gave me the opportunity to be part of it. Uh, 38 years in the military and uh, uh, first, thank you so much for your service to the country, you, and, uh, and thank you for, for visiting our campus and, and this show. In the two or three minutes we have left, I, I'd just like uh, folks to get a, a sense of you as a person. You, you were the first military in your family, you explained was, to me, yeah. and you went to the academy, and you were struck <laughs> by something turned you on about SEALs. Why did you want to become a SEAL? Yeah, that's, uh, I don't mean to make it more complex than it is, but I did go to the Naval Academy at a time of uh, at the height of the Vietnam War protest. And, and in fact, I had attended a war protest with inside of the Capitol and was proud that we lived in a country that permitted that sort of activity. And I was inspired to serve in, in some way. I found my way to the, uh, to the Naval Academy, but uh, I have to say that, uh, that while there, I, I, I I learned about myself that I didn't really want the, the classic traditional regimented military. I wanted to do something a little bit different within the uniformed service. And so I was attracted to CBs and explosive ordnance disposal and the underwater demolition team SEAL community and ultimately found my way, uh, found my way into that as, uh, as, as one of a few members of my class who was fortunate to be selected for, for that career path. That is just wonderful. And I know uh, your reputation in the field, uh, guests from San Diego and throughout the Southland came to visit and hear you at, uh, at the Distinguished Speaker Series uh, event. And, uh, uh, and you did it in the background. As you pointed out to me that you never did interviews while you were in command. You, you yeah. just did the job. No, I'm just coming out of that shell now. <laughs> uh, this is probably the most public uh, I've ever been. Uh, but I'm, I'm doing it because I think the, the American people have some right to know what it is they've invested in in their special operations community. I, this isn't about marketing. This isn't about controversy or politics. This is simply about educating uh, in a way that, uh, 
that I feel able to do from my experience. Uh, and, and talking about the, 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 the values, the balance of the Special Operations community. Well, Admiral, again, thank you for joining us. And through you, thank the thousands of men and women Absolutely. in your command and elsewhere that uh, uh, sacrifice so much to protect our country each and every day. Thank you so much. Good to be with you, Art. Okay. Thank you for joining us. And uh, uh, this is Art Levine. Uh, thanking you for being part of our In Conversation show and saying good night from the campus of California State University, Long Beach.